Despite my dislike of Nintendo's latest business practices with their expensive and so far mediocre online expansion pack, I have been enjoying the Nintendo 64 titles offered, including the main one many have been complaining about recently due to emulation issues, Ocarina of Time. I uploaded a Dark Aspects episode on this game in the distant past, about 7 years ago actually, which means that if I was Young Link then, I could now wield the Master Sword, so I figured it was time to completely remake the video, just like I did with my crusty old Earthbound analysis. As I replayed Ocarina of Time while taking notes, I was surprised at just how many times I had to stop and jot down a moment worth mentioning. Today, a more adult Thane is going to revisit his recurring childhood nightmare of Castletown infested with redids. There's surprisingly already a lot to talk about within the very first hour of the game. Link, who grew up thinking he was Kokiri, a species of woodland children reportedly given life by the Great Deku Tree, is called to action by this forest spirit who's decaying because of a death curse cast by the main antagonist, Ganondorf. After entering the Great Deity's body and successfully exterminating a pernicious parasite, the Great Deku Tree, who acted as the only father figure in Link's life, reveals that it's too late to recover from his condition, and withers in front of the child once he gives Link the talk. About his destiny, that is. Link was already rejected by many of his Kokiri peers for not having a fairy of his own until the start of this quest, but now he's shunned because it's believed he had something to do with the Great Deku Tree's demise. Whatever, it's time to leave for Hyrule anyway, and no one can follow Link because they, as a people, supposedly die upon venturing outside of the forest. This is especially bad for them now as the tree was a guardian who watched over the hallowed land. So when he died, monsters were able to invade the forest, forcing the trapped Kokiri to go into hiding. A new Great Deku Tree does take root later on, but it doesn't sprout for seven whole years, meaning that in this timeline, Ganondorf's forces are able to thrive in the Kokiri's home for nearly a decade. The Kokiri can't leave the forest, but according to Fado, Anyone else who enters and gets lost in the Lost Woods becomes a skeletal monster known as a Stalfos, which is the unfortunate fate of Grog, the grandson of the potion shop owner. This witch wants Link to deliver medicine she made for Grog from a mushroom he found in the forest, but knowingly remarks that it won't work on a monster, implying she has an inkling he's already turned into one. Sure enough, Fado announces what happened to Grog in a creepy way right before laughing while asking if Link will turn into a Stalfos too. One more thing about the forest before we make the Stalchild plagued trek to Hyrule Castle. When the Deku Tree Sprout is born, it tells Link a story about the hero's biological mother. Before their king unified the land of Hyrule, there was a fierce war where Link's mom was gravely injured. Entering the Forbidden Forest, she had no choice but to entrust the child to the Deku Tree. Link never knew his late mother, or his birth father, we can presume died fighting in the same war. If you don't want to simply hear about dying Hylians, you can actually watch one perish with your own eyes. If you don't remember this scene, it's probably because it's incredibly easy to miss. The player doesn't have much need to go into the back alley of Castletown, unless you want an optional piece of hearts or black market bomb chews. Though if you visit this side street after Ganondorf chases Zelda on horseback, but before unsheathing the Master Sword for the first time, you'll find this man, who will slowly and shakily tell you that he tried to stop Ganondorf's men after the Gerudo thief betrayed their king. Because of his labored speech, it's likely he was mortally wounded from this encounter. So when he struggles to keep his arm up after speaking and suddenly falls limp, we can safely presume he died on screen. Nabi's follow-up comment further implying this with an ellipsis. Backing away from the lifeless corpse to check in on an animate one, we have the aforementioned Redids that left a strong impression on a young Thane. They overwhelm the once booming castle town when Link ages himself up seven years by pulling the Master Sword out from its pedestal within the Temple of Time. The immediately dire atmosphere that waited outside the walls of this sanctuary came as quite the shock, 
my prepubescent self was not expecting the lively, friendly faces of Castletown to be replaced with these shrieking, soulless monstrosities. As a kid, I didn't know that most everyone fled to Kakariko Village, so I thought they had all become zombies, which made me run crying to my mother for comfort. She scolded me for playing those types of games, but all I could say in response was, It's just Zelda! Similarly, when I got to Ikana Valley and Majora's Mask at around the same age, I had to turn down the volume on my TV all the way, and I swear I could still hear that haunting theme through the muted speakers. This isn't even the first time you can meet the Rededs in Ocarina of Time. It's just a very evocative memory for me. The player can experience early onset trauma for themselves towards the beginning of the game if they want by heading straight to the Kakariko Village graveyard from the forest. Desecrating a certain gravestone by dragging it and entering the tomb allows a meet and greet with this lurker in the dark. They are creepy undead creatures that inhabit grim, dingy places like this, letting out paralyzing screeches so they can slowly stagger over to Link and wrap themselves around him in an attempt to bite their victim to death. Quite a few of them can be found after learning Zelda's lullaby and opening up the royal family's tomb via lightning strike, somehow. Redead seem to thrive in this ghastly crypt, which features poisonous, inexplicable green liquid. Immediately preceding this room too is an ossuary, housing all kinds of bones that belong to what look like monsters, as well as some clearly human slash Hylian skeletons, warning of the aforementioned creatures that await those who disturb the royal tomb. Getting the heck out of there and pushing past this kid who likes to hang out in the cemetery all day, takes us to another petrifying point of interest, the House of Skultula, conveniently located in the same village. This building was once home to a wealthy family who were all consumed by greed. Because of their apparent avarice, the father and his five sons were cursed by Ganondorf to live as horrifying spider people so long as gold Skultulas roam the kingdom of Hyrule. You can attack and stun any member of the cursed family by striking the weak spot with Link's sword, which elicits a cry, causing them to become temporarily hostile. Or you can, you know, do what you're supposed to and save them all one by one to reap their, honestly increasingly disappointing rewards after the final wallet upgrade. This theme of the rich paying a different kind of price for their greed is explored later on in the series with Giovanni of Twilight Princess selling his soul to Imp Pose in exchange for his fortune, which cursed him and his cat to turn into immobile golden statues. That's enough body horror for now, or is it? Still staying within Kakariko Village, seriously most of the disturbing things in this game come from here, takes us to their apparent water supply, the bottom of the well, which doubles as a catacomb. Yeah. Besides featuring the horrifying yet standard for this game batch of enemies, namely Beemos, Florin Wallmasters, Gibdos, Skultulas, Bubbles, Keese, Like Likes, and Redids, the bottom of the well is where we're introduced to everyone's favorite pale, supposedly blood-spattered, blobby abomination dead hand. I didn't make it this far into the game as a kid, but if I had, I'd probably skip the crying and go right into screaming at the top of my lungs in sheer terror at this nightmarish thing. Countless hands reach up from underneath its den, entirely composed of human skeletons, which are littered across the floor, walls, and ceiling to try and grab at Link, while its body slinks across the floor, bearing a toothy, gummy smile with an ungodly taste for flesh. Stepping around prison cells, tools of torture, and an inordinate amount of human remains brings us out of the well and into the similarly unspeakable Shadow Temple, located in, you guessed it, Kakariko Village. This is quite probably the scariest dungeon in the entire series, as it was historically used by the Sheikah to imprison, interrogate, and torture enemies of the royal family. By the time of Ocarina of Time, it is taboo for the royal family to speak of the Shadow Temple and its horrific purpose, because it stands as a symbol of Hyrule's dark and bloody history of greed and hatred. Like the bottom of the well, the inside of the dungeon is literally stained with blood, some of which was censored in the 3DS remake, with several rooms containing torture devices, like hanging chains and guillotines, the latter of which working to obstruct the player. There's even a couple of saltires, also known as St. Andrew's Cross, named after the Apostle, who was crucified on one in Greece, located in each, with dried pools of blood underneath them. 
The three previous temples Adult Link had to venture through were based on traditional elements of nature, earth, fire, and water, while this one is themed around shadow and death, with haunting imagery abound, ending with a ride on the foggy Ferry to the Other World, which appears to be based on Karen's Ferry of Greek mythology to greet the temple boss Bongo Bongo. Sure, that name doesn't exactly strike fear into the heart, but the steady beating of his drums sounds as if he's leading a war battle, a funeral march, or a military execution, the last of which could tie into his mysterious origin as we'll talk about in a bit. The arena you're fighting on is the oversized drumhead, incessantly pounded by his disembodied hands that sort of look like giant wall and floor masters. Being hurled, knocked back, or simply falling off the side of the drum means exposing Link to that ghastly greenish poison Reededs like to populate around, so you won't find stable footing anywhere in this arena. The Phantom Shadow Beast reveals a weak point after the player stuns its hands, a piercing red eye protected by petal-like skin flaps. Unlike other floating hand plus eyeball monsters very common in Nintendo games too, Bongo Bongo's hands look like they were amputated as his veiny arms end in two bloody stumps. In Sharia Islamic law, certain acts of stealing are considered an offense against God, the hudud, or punishment as prescribed by God, and outlined in a verse of the Quran, is to cut off the thief's hands. Like the earlier versions of the fire temple music with chanting that resembles a Muslim prayer, along with all of the replaced star and crescent moon symbols, is this another instance of Ocarina of Time being inspired by Islamic religion? What if Bongo Bongo used to be human, and in life stole from the royal family, so he was imprisoned and mutilated by the Sheikah tribe? Whatever the reason, I do think his hands were dismembered in the Shadow Temple, and it's likely he was later executed by decapitation too, as his eyeball here is attached to the neck, which could have been separated from the head by any of these guillotines. This would explain the boss's connection to the temple, and give an origin for this wrathful, evil spirit that had to be sealed inside of the well. The Shadow Temple makes for the creepiest dungeon in the game, as it's nothing but terrifying through and through, though I do think it's safe to say that surprisingly, all dungeons in Ocarina of Time borrow some elements of horror, which is exactly what I'll be covering in part 2 of this Dark Aspects analysis. I hope to see you then, but before that, I have one question. What do you think Bongo Bongo is saying when he sings? If you give a good answer, he might not visit you in your dreams. See you next time.